Finishing up our introduction to respiratory anatomy. So we started up in the pharynx, didn't we? And then we went down through the larynx. Then we did the trachea. We did the primary bronchi and some secondary tertiary. Now we're down to the bronchioles. Now we're down to the tiniest of the tubes, all right? We're at the end of the branching. These are the little itty-bitty tubes. Bronchial tree, 20 to 25 orders. So remember, we have the primary bronchus, secondary, tertiary bronchus, Remember, after that, we don't number, but we could number, in theory, all the way down to 20 or 25, okay? So branching and branching and branching, they keep branching all the way, 20 to 25 orders of branching. Primary, secondary, tertiary, then bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, and then, as I mentioned before, finally, respiratory bronchioles, and those would actually have alveoli attached to them. Bronchial arteries that come off the thoracic aorta provide blood supply to lung tissue. Let me make an, uh, an important point here. Your lungs have two different circulations, blood circulations. So you have the pulmonary arteries and veins. Those are to get oxygen in and out of your blood, all right? But you also have to have bronchial arteries, and those are for supplying blood to your lung tissues themselves, all right? So do you get it? Two completely separate um, circulatory pathways, two different blood supplies going in and out of your lungs. The pulmonary for oxygenation of the blood and then the bronchial to supply blood to the lung tissues themselves. All right, two circulations in the lungs. Pulmonary arteries come off the pulmonary trunk, provide gas exchange. So there you are, those are the two circulations, the bronchial and the pulmonary. Once bronchioles get less than a millimeter in diameter, there's no cartilage. Cartilage is now in that it's only smooth muscle. Bronchoconstrictions where the smooth muscle contraction with narrowing of the airways. So one of the main causes of this in, in terms of physiology and healthcare, histamine. So remember, when histamine is a normal part of the immune response, remember histamine released by the basophils and by the mast cells. And remember, the, one of the reasons for histamine was to vasodilate blood vessels. So that was to bring more blood to the area, more white blood cells to fight the bad guys, more nutrients for tissue repair, and so on. So histamine is a vasodilator, but histamine is also a bronchoconstrictor. So that when you have inflammation, your bronchi, your bronchioles get smaller. And you're thinking, wait, what the hell? Why would your body do that to you? Well, here's the thing. Remember, this is an immune response. So immune response, you know, it could be like a respiratory virus or some kind of contaminants in the air are getting into your lungs. Well, we don't want that to happen. We don't want your lungs to get infected and contaminated. So your body naturally, at the same time that it's vasodilating your arterioles, it's bronchoconstricting trying to keep the junk out of your lungs at the same time that it dilates blood vessels. And histamine is the main way of doing that, all right? So keep that in mind. Histamine, a vasodilator, but a bronchoconstrictor. And it does make sense. You're trying to keep your lungs from getting infected and contaminated. Bronchodilation, where smooth muscle rela relaxation with the lumen of airways increasing in size. And you should know which receptors do this, right? Um... So this is sympathetic nervous stimulation, uh, system stimulation with the beta 2s, all right? Beta 2s. Remember, people that have asthma, what's happening in an asthma attack is your immune system is responding by bronchoconstricting, all right? And so what do you have to do? You have to bronchodilate in a hurry. How do you do that? Get some beta 2 agonists down there into your lungs, and that's what's in those asthma rescue inhalers. Those are simply you know, albuterol, ventolin. Those are beta-2 agonists. They are bronchodilating, okay, in order to combat your immune system, which is trying to bronchoconstrict. So terminal bronchioles, terminal means the end, all right? So these are the last bronchioles, except they're not actually. They're respiratory bronchioles after these. But you can see in the lower left illustration, terminal bronchioles, less than half a millimeter in diameter. So these are eensy, weensy, teensy, weensy, tiny. Over 65,000 terminal bronchioles between the two lungs. 
So you have lots of tubes. Why do you have so many? Well, so that if one or two of them or three or four or five or six or 20 get clogged up, you've still got 64,980, right? It's, again, it's kind of a backup system for your body. Have tons of these bronchioles, and that way if any of them get damaged or clogged or whatever, you've still got many, many more to try to help you breathe. One bronchiole may divide into 50 to 80 terminal bronchioles, all right? So lots of those terminal bronchioles. There are no mucus glands down here, no goblet cells, very few cilia. So remember, mucus glands, all right, goblet cells are what secrete mucus. Very few cilia. Remember, we saw those respiratory cilia earlier. And so what do we have down here? Macrophages. Remember, Kupfer cells, they were called? Or these are dust cells. Sorry, Kupfer's in the liver. These are the alveolar dust cells. So you got macrophages just waiting down there in the alveoli. So the bad guys make it all the way this far. If they didn't get caught, caught by the Malt brothers earlier on, you've got macrophages waiting for them down in the alveoli, trying to kill them, all right? Trying to keep you alive, keep you safe, keep you from getting infected. Each one divides into two or more respiratory bronchioles. And the key here is that the respiratory bronchioles actually have alveolar sacs coming off of them, alveoli or alveolar sacs. Terminal bronchioles do not have alveoli or alveolar sacs. The respiratory bronchioles do, okay? So there you can see. And notice how the alveoli are covered with capillary bits. Why? You should know. What's the main job of your respiratory system? You gotta get oxygen into your blood and you gotta get CO2 out. So the capillaries that completely cover the alveoli, that's where we're taking oxygen into our blood and that's where we're getting the CO2 out. It's happening right there in the alveoli. So the respiratory bronchial is now all the way down at the end. This is the beginning of the respiratory zone versus the conducting zone. Everything up to this point has been conducting zone. Remember, all that's happening in the conducting zone is air is getting moved from one place to another. There is no actual gas exchange. The respiratory zone is where gas exchange takes place, where we actually move gases into and out of the blood, all right? So each respiratory bronchial divides into two to 10 alveolar ducts, all right? And you can see the illustrations there trying to show that. The alveolar ducts end in alveolar sacs. Alveolar sacs are clusters of individual alveoli or alveoli. Singular is alveolus, plural alveoli. So um, notice again how it looks like, it looks like little bunches of grapes, like on the right-hand illustration in the upper left-hand corner. See, it looks like little bunches of grapes. Each little bunch of grapes is the sac, and then each grape is an alveolus. So the alveoli themselves, here we go, air pouches 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So these are tiny. Remember that little tiny line on my hand was one millimeter. These are only half of that line down to only, you know, a fifth of that line. Um, so these are tiny little sacs, little air pouches, all right? And they have specialized cells inside. Type 1 alveolar cells, also called squamous cells, these are simple squamous epithelial cells for gas exchange. So this is where the oxygen actually gets from the air into the blood and the CO2 gets from the blood out into the air. That's 95% of the surface of the alveolus because, again, your, the whole goal of your lungs is to do gas exchange. So most of the surface is for gas exchange, all right? The type 1 alveolar cells. There are also these type 2 or great alveolar cells, septal cells, another name. They secrete surfactant. So surfactant, um, like detergents have surfactant. You know how, if, like, you get detergent on your hand? Um, it's all really slippery. So a surfactant is something that decreases surface tension. Here's the problem. When you breathe out, when you expire, in the sense of breathing out, not in the sense of dying, what's going to happen is your alveoli have to collapse to squeeze the air out, all right? <gasps> That's all my alveoli just collapse to squeeze the air out. Well, you wouldn't want your alveoli sticking together after they collapse. That would be very bad. So you secrete surfactant. Surfactant is like detergent. It makes the insides of the alveoli slippery so that when they collapse to expel the air, they don't stick together. All right? 
Surfactant is extremely important as well. Lack of surfactant means potentially you could suffocate because your alveoli will stick together. Then you also have these alveolar macrophages down there. They're called alveolar dust cells. Again, this is because there are not any cilia down here anymore, right? No, I mean, this, is, this is basically the only way left you've got to catch bad guys, alveolar macrophages. And the outer surface, as I mentioned before, a network of blood capillaries branching off the pulmonary arteries. So the blood vessels covering, so in the upper right illustration, those arteries and veins, those would be pulmonary, all right? <clears throat> you also have, remember, the um, uh, brachial arteries and veins, which are actually supplying blood and taking uh, blood away from the lung tissues themselves. But the alveoli are covered with the pulmonary um, capillaries. <clears throat> And there you see a nice illustration, all right? It's kind of got all the stuff we've been talking about, right? Spend a moment or two. Check that out. Look at all that stuff. There you see. Okay, so the respiratory membrane itself consists of four layers of tissue, 0.5 microns thick. So remember, a micron is a millionth of a meter. So this is microscopic now. By the way, look at the lower right illustration. That's wonderful. See how it shows the type 2 alveolar cell, the septal cell? Do you remember? A little self-test. What's that doing? That's secreting <clears throat> surfactant. And then see there's the alveolar macrophage, all right? And then the whole rest of the membrane there would be the type 1 cells. <clears throat> Got that Rona. <clears throat> so the air-blood barrier with gas on one side and air on the other. So that's what's happening here. We have to have, so in the uh, lower illustration, you can see where it shows a capillary. It shows a red blood cell. Um, this is where, actually, the blood and the alveolus comes together, and you're going to get actual, and so on the inset, notice, you've actually got oxygen and CO2 moving across the respiratory membrane. See it there in the lower right? Oxygen going in, CO2 going out, they are going across the respiratory membrane. See how it says capillary basement membrane, epithelium basement, basement membrane? That's all the respiratory membrane. That's where the gases actually get back and forth between the air and your blood. So the alveolar pores connect adjacent alveoli. They allow air pressure throughout the lung to equalize, providing alternative routes for alveoli with damaged bronchioles. So once again, that's what I was saying before. You've got so many bronchioles because in case there's damage from whatever reason, you know, you might get a severe lung infection. You might get pneumonia. Some of your lungs might now be damaged. If you only had like three um, bronchioles, you'd be out of luck. The fact that you've got thousands of them means that even if your lungs get damaged, you've got lots of others that can pick up the slack. So the two lungs between them contain 300 million alveoli. Oh my God. That's almost as many people as there are in the United States. Combined surface area of 750 square feet, the size of a racquetball court. So in other words, if you were to take all those individual alveolar sacs, uh, well, and individual alveoli, and, you know, spread them out flat, you could cover an entire racquetball court. Your lungs have enough respiratory membrane to cover a racquetball court. So you can see... We're getting every breath of air, every breath you take, every move you make, every vow you break, every claim you stake, um, you are moving a tremendous amount of gas back and forth across that respiratory membrane. It's the size of a damn racquetball court. Okay, so continuing with the lungs then, um, we looked at all the way down prior to the uh, respiratory passageways and so on. Let's move back out to some macro anatomy and look at the lungs themselves. So you've got one on each side of the mediastinum. Remember, that's that cavity in the center of your thorax. The right lung has three lobes, um, broader and shorter than the left lung. Left lung has two lobes, 10% smaller <clears throat> than the right lung, okay? So notice, take a look there on the lower illustration and on the top. You can see how the right lung has three lobes, left lung has two lobes. <clears throat> 
Then remember they are enclosed in one of these serous membranes called the pleura. Remember the serous membranes? This goes all the way back to 201, and we talked about it here this semester as well. So different kinds of um, uh, serous membranes, the one that goes around the heart, the pericardium, the one that goes around your intestinal, um, your abdominal cavity, the um, peritoneum, and then for the lungs, the pleura, all right? And remember, serous membranes have two layers, one that's on the organ itself, and one that lines the cavity. So the parietal pleura, remember the word parietal, like the parietal bone, forms the wall of your cranium, the wall of your skull. Parietal means wall. So the parietal pleura are the outer membrane, all right? They form the wall of the pleura, the wall of the serous membrane. And then the visceral pleura, remember viscera means organ. So the visceral pleura are the serous membranes that are on the lung tissue itself. So look at that upper illustration. You can see they're showing you the, the darkest pink there, the innermost layer, that's the lung itself. Notice the lung itself is covered by the visceral pleura. Then there's a little space. That would be the pleural cavity. And then the outer layer, the parietal pleura. Okay, so that's what's going on there. You've got the layers, you know, the inset at the far upper right. There you can see the parietal pleura, the outermost layer, the visceral pleura, the innermost layer, and then the pleural cavity is the space in between. Okay, pleural cavity. Apex is superior to the clavicle, right? So the apex, the point at the top of the lung, goes above your collarbone. Think about that. Feel your collarbone right now. Imagine the fact that your lung actually goes slightly above that. It's really funny. I used to, <clears throat> from all the sports I played, I totally, my left shoulder is just shot to hell. And I used to go in every few years and get um, a cortisone shot into my left shoulder. And I, I noticed that the doctor, he would, he would use my, um, you know, the little knobby thing that you got on the bone there. Remember what that is? Rem remember the little knob where the scapula comes together with the clavicle, the acromion, remember? So... The acromion was what my doctor would use as the landmark for inserting the needle. And he would go in a little ways, and then he would turn and move laterally. And I say, why did you turn laterally? He says, because I don't want to drop your lung. And the, the, the doctor is the cool lingo, drop a lung. Drop a lung means that you actually, when you pierce a lung, then you get a collapsed lung. And um, that is going to take some doing to fix. So be very embarrassing for my primary care physician in trying to give me a cortisone shot to actually cause me to get a collapsed lung and have to try to explain that on my charts, okay? So he was always very careful to make a lateral turn so that he didn't poke the needle of my cortisone shot into my lung and collapse my lung. Then the base of the lung sits on the diaphragm, all right? So at the very bottom, that's actually in physical contact with your diaphragm. So when you breathe in, when you take a deep breath, what happens is your diaphragm is actually folding downwards. When your diaphragm um, contracts, it folds downward. So it is literally pulling on your lung. What it does is it elongates your lung. It pulls your lung into a larger vertical cavity. And what that does is that literally sucks air into your lungs. And then when your diaphragm relaxes, it returns to normal, so it, it pushes back up again. And what that does is it literally then pushes on the lung, literally forces air back out of the lung, okay? So that's the deal. The lungs physically sit on the diaphragm, and the diaphragm physically pulls air into the lung and physically pushes air back out again. The phrenic nerve is what innervates the diaphragm, all right? So... And this is why, you know, you don't have to, you can go to sleep. You know, if you didn't have the phrenic nerve, you would die every night when you went to sleep. The phrenic nerve sends an automatic impulse to your lung about 12 to 20 times per minute. And that's why you, all you need to breathe is the diaphragm. You don't need any other muscles. Now, forced inspiration and expiration, we'll see coming up, does require other muscles like your intercostals and your abdominal obliques and so on. When you want to like blow out the candles on a birthday cake, when you do a forceful exhalation, when you, you know, that's now you're using more than just your diaphragm. But your diaphragm alone is capable of just pulling the air and pushing the air out. 
That's why you can go to sleep, and as long as the phrenic nerve keeps firing, your diaphragm will keep contracting, relaxing, contracting, relaxing, and that in and of itself is enough to exchange air in your lungs. Remember the phrenic nerve comes out between C3 and C5. We say C3 to C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Right? That's why um, any kind of a spinal injury um, in that area is potentially going to make it so you can't breathe anymore. Right? That's, the, that's the critical cutoff there. So some lung pathology. Pleuritis means inflammation of the pleura. Once again, itis always means inflammation. Pleuritis, inflammation of the pleura. That's bad. That's painful. Not enough fluid. You get what's called a pleural friction rub. Um, you can actually hear that through the stethoscope. You can hear like a creaking sound as the membranes rub when people try to breathe. That's extremely painful. Um, too much fluid, pleural effusion. You actually get fluid in there. This is extremely dangerous because um, you lose compliance of the lung and the lung can no longer expand and, and uh, contract. And so this can cause uh, an inability to breathe. They have to do a, they have to basically do a procedure there where they punch it with a needle in order to allow the fluid to escape. Thoracentesis, removal of excel, excess fluid in the pleural cavity, which is what I was just talking about. Thoracentesis, you got to get that fluid out of there. Atelectasis means a, um, a collapse of a portion or all of a lung. Um, so. Um, this is what happens, um, you know, various kinds of damage, um, punctures, you know, sometimes in an accident, a rib will puncture a lung or whatever. Once that happens, you drop a lung. And I used to have a, a picture, one of the girls in my class had, um, she had a collapsed lung at one point, and she gave me her x-ray. That was so cool. But um, she, um, it, was, it was cool, especially because she had really big boobs, and on the x-ray, you could see the outline of her breast. And I said, um, Brian, we can see. And she says, I don't care. I said, all right, that's fine. Pneumothorax means air in the pleural space. So um, you can get fluid in the pleural space or you can get air in the pleural space. Both of those, again, um, are serious and potentially problematic because they will impair your ability to breathe. Likewise, you can get blood in there. That's hemothorax, all right? Blood in the pleural space. Then RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, a deficiency of surfactant. So sometimes um, newborn babies, premature babies, all right, what happens is surfactant, remember those uh, alveolar cells, all right, the, the cell that made the surfactant, the septal cell. So what can happen is sometimes those occur later in development, sometimes than when a premature baby is born. So a premature baby is born before it has those cells to make the surfactant. And so what happens is every time it breathes out, the alveoli stick together. And that makes it very hard to breathe in again. So look, you see in the, in the right lower right, you can see the collapsed alveoli. That little baby is going to be struggling to breathe. And you don't want babies to have to struggle to breathe. So what happens is they have artificial surfactant. All right. My next door neighbor was a NICU nurse. And she, when I was talking to her about this, she said they don't use Cervanta anymore. She says that's old. There's a newer one that they all use now. But basically, it's just simply artificial surfactant. And you just administer it to the baby, and that then causes the alveoli to be, um, not to stick together so that they, you won't have the respiratory distress syndrome. Common problem in premature babies, okay? So physiology of ventilation, um, we're not talking about that kind of ventilation down there, the plumber ventilation. So pulmonary, pulmonary ventilation is the fancy word for what we call breathing, pulmonary ventilation. Atmospheric air enters and leaves the alveoli. Then there's alveolar gas exchange, that's gas exchange at the respiratory membrane, which we saw oxygen going into the blood, CO2 coming out, external respiration, that's often called, and then transport of gases in the blood. Um, we have to get the gas, you know, from the lungs to the tissues. We have to get CO2 from the tissues to the lungs. And then systemic gas exchange, where we have gas exchange between the systemic capillaries, the interstitial fluid, and the cells. So notice, we're going to be talking about this coming up. Alveolar gas exchange versus systemic gas exchange. 
Alveolar gas exchange happens in the lungs. Systemic gas exchange happens in the tissues of your body. So think about it. What direction are the gases going in alveolar gas exchange? In alveolar gas exchange, oxygen is going, oxygen is going into the blood. <clears throat> CO2 is going out. Um, but what happens in systemic gas exchange in the tissues? That's where oxygen is leaving the blood and CO2 is coming in. Now, how the hell does your body know that in the alveoli, the oxygen is supposed to go in and the CO2 is supposed to go out? How does it know that in the tissues, the oxygen is supposed to go out and the CO2 is supposed to go in? Hmm, there's a puzzle. We'll see an answer to that coming about. So notice, um, you can see there, <clears throat> up in the upper right, examples there. What's that PCO2? I wonder what that has to do with, maybe it has to do with pressure. Yeah. And then notice in the lower right, you know, buildings. That's building ventilation. You know, everything has to be ventilated. Buildings get ventilation. Your body has to have ventilation, right? So that's why we call it ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation is what breathing is. And so systemic gas exchange is internal respiration, whereas alveolar gas exchange is external respiration. Okay, so which statement is false? Histamine causes bronchodilation. Atelectasis is collapse of the lung. Left lung smaller than the right lung. Gas exchange does not take place in terminal bronchioles. Type 2 alveolar cells secrete surfactant. What do you say? One of those is wrong. Yeah, histamine is a bronchoconstrictor, remember? Histamine is a vasodilator, but a bronchoconstrictor.